Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Tisha Livingston. She is CEO at Infinite Acres and president at 80 Acres Farm. I've had the pleasure of getting to work with Tisha. Our startups were founded at similar times. Tisha, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Well, thank you so much for including me and letting me be part of it. So when we met, you were founding 80 Acres Farms, an indoor agricultural hub. Can you tell us about 80 Acres, its birth, and uh, now the birth of Infinite Acres? Yeah. So um, 80 Acres, we founded in November of 2015. And my business partner, Mike Zelkin, and I, um, we were really looking for a way to find a solution to our food issues and our supply chain issues related to the food. Um, I don't know if everyone knows, but the food that we eat travels thousands of miles and tends to be, you know, seven to 14 days old before it even gets to our grocery stores. We recognize that people are really wanting to be able to eat fresh food and they want it to be grown in a sustainable way. They want to know who their growers are. They want to know that there's no pesticides on their produce and they want to make sure that they have... um, that they have freshness when they bring it home and they have time to be able to consume it and enjoy instead of throwing it away. So we decided to scour the world, really. We went all over Asia and then we went all over Europe looking for technology where we could bring fresh produce into the city of Cincinnati. And uh, after we we explored a while, we found some great technology partners and uh, we decided to start, start 80 Acres. So so we uh, we were in the same startup uh, hub with you when yes, we first started. Yes. So uh, Mike and I, when we first started, we were uh, in my sunroom and over his garage. And so that was the true, you know, it was like really hardcore startup. You are you are an official garage guru. We, then. <laughs> well, I don't know about guru, but we, we, we did officially start in a garage and we thought that was very apropos. Uh, but as we started uh, bringing on more and more team members, we recognized that we needed to find some space where we could all kind of meet instead of it just being uh, in my kitchen. So, uh, yeah, so, so we started um, 2015. Our first farm that we purchased uh, is on SD Avenue, and it was a um, an abandoned warehouse there. And so we found it. It was a perfect size because it was it. It's it's kind of like the Three Bears. It wasn't too big. It wasn't too small. <laughs> it was just right. And there is where we started developing our technology to be able to grow produce. Uh, and so I've toured this, yes. that particular site. It's yeah. incredible to see towers of plants yes. essentially growing to the ceiling. Everything indoor. Yeah. All uh, all of the. Um, agriculture being sort of facilitated by sensor technology yeah. and water technology. It's incredibly sustainable. Um, tell yeah. us, yeah, could you paint a picture for, for people? I'm trying to, to paint it a little bit here, but it's sort of like. Yeah, so it's it's really about figuring out how to create and control an environment to be able to I say unleash the potentials of plants. So we have one system that's a multi-layer system. So it's racks stacked on top of one another. And that's where we grow lettuce and leafy greens and basil um, and other herbs. And uh, and then we have another room that I think you're referring to, which is our vine room, where we're growing uh, tomatoes and cucumbers, and we've grown peppers and eggplants in that room as well. Um, that room is very special to me. That's where we keep our bumblebees. So they're the best pollinators. So we have bumblebees flying around um, in our grow system. So our systems, uh, our indoor farming systems are 100% under LED light. And um, we control um, the the climate. So not only do we control the temperature and the humidity, but the CO2 levels. And we do it um, with great uniformity, which is really the, the technology advancement that we have working with our partners that makes what we do really special. And um, and then we also are able to uptake, control the uptake of of water and nutrients that the plants take. And I don't know if if you know, but most plants they only absorb they absorb a lot of water, but they only retain about eight percent of it and create you know leaf dry matter that we actually consume. And the rest of it they transpire into the air. 
So when I did you're, not know that. Yeah, so when you're in, um, you know, outside, uh, you have to put a lot of water onto the plants. And then um, when they transpire, the, it, it evaporates into the air. Well, because we're in a completely controlled system, we're able to capture that evaporation. We're able to condense it. And then we're able to recirculate it back through. So we use 97% less water than you would in traditional farming. Wow. So that's what makes us really sustainable. And you also have, so you have this large indoor agriculture facility, but you also sort of have movable mobile yeah. units as well, right? Right. Yeah. And those that we, we use... Um, shipping containers. And that's what we really started with because we felt like a shipping container was a perfect size to be able to start, to be able to learn how to grow. It's um, it's it's self-contained. If you screw it up, then, you know, you can start over in a relatively easy way. And then we, we learned a lot about our lights and our airflow and CO2 levels and seeds and grow media um, in these small modules. And the good thing about the modules is you can pick them up and you can move them other places. So as we started to grow, we put modules in North Carolina, which is actually where they where we build most of them. We have them in Cincinnati, and then we also have them in Arkansas, and we have them in Alabama. So you can pick them up, and you can it's it's an interesting way to be able to uh, start entering into a market. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know when we had the honor of collaborating at, at Untold with mm -hmm. 80 Acres, we were supporting grant writing, especially around challenges that society faces, such as food deserts mm -hmm. and the need for more nutrient-dense produce. And you are solving those problems in such interesting ways by having produce that's much fresher, much more nutrient, and able to be mobile and mm -hmm. come into a community. Can you share a little bit about how you came to realize the impacts that were made possible by the technologies and, and the innovations you were creating? Yeah, I think that uh, when Mike and I first started, we were we were traveling all over the U.S. We worked for a company called um, Seger Creek Vegetable Company, and they were a company that unfortunately had gone into bankruptcy. And then they brought us in. That's what Mike and I did. We worked in food manufacturing, and when there was a company that was in distress, uh, we would come in. We would help try to turn them around and, and drive improvement. So you worked together with Mike before that? Yeah, so okay. Mike, Mike and I have worked together for about 12 years. Okay, yeah. And so in this particular job, uh, when we when we came in, um, they were it was a canning company. And because of the the bankruptcy and the issues that they had, they didn't have any contracts with with growers and they had sold off all their fields. And so, you know, one of the things that when you're trying to turn a company around, you have to have product to be able to sell. And we didn't have any product to be able to put into a can. Um, because none of the growers were growing green beans and sweet potatoes and white potatoes and corn and all of the things that you think about in canned food. So we had to go travel across the U.S. So we started down in the in the Gulf of Mexico in Texas, and we went all the way up to Wisconsin. And we met with every grower that would that would talk to us because we needed to be able to extend the season. We needed to be able to have them plant some of their fields for, for us to be able to go into our canning factories. And we also went from the panhandle of Florida all the way up to Buffalo, New York. Um, because if you think about growing seasons and the way that our climate warms in the, in the spring and then cools in the summer, you, you can go up the coast as it gets warmer and then you come back down. Um, the, the coast to be able to, uh, it's, it's the way to extend the growing season, essentially. So when we met with all these growers, um, we quickly began to realize that they were struggling. There's a lot of challenges um, with growers. Sometimes they have good crop years and sometimes they have bad crop years. And the common theme, and they used a lot of different words to explain what their struggles were. Um, said sometimes they didn't have enough heat units. Sometimes it was too much rain, not enough rain. Their, their soils were depleted, too much pest pressure. Um, but the common denominator is that they couldn't control their environment. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest issue. Um, they can't control Mother Nature. Yeah. And so we thought there has to be a better way. Besides the fact that we were trucking produce all over the country to be able to go into our one farm or our one processing facility. So uh, moving all this produce around, there was a lot left in the fields. There was a lot that was damaged, a lot that was poor quality by the time it got to our farm. And the farmers weren't really um, feeling really good about what they were doing either. They were really struggling. So that's when Mike and I decided that um, our food supply is pretty fragile. 
and it's really dependent on weather. And uh, like you had mentioned before, uh, global global climate is changing, and there are a lot of issues. You're seeing severity of weather. You're seeing uh, crazy temperatures. It was very warm a, a week ago. We really haven't had a very a hard winter here in in Cincinnati. Snowing yesterday, but it was you know 60 degrees a couple days before. Plants get confused by that because they need triggers and signs for the what Mother Nature's telling them to do. Whether they should they should flower or they should um, drop their fruit or, or fruit at all. So so it, it's it's very fragile and. Uh, we figured that there had to be a better way. There has to be technology out there that's going to solve our issues. And so we started traveling all over. And when we traveled, we were looking for um, solutions with technology. And the, the, the challenge was we knew about indoor farming, but indoor farming hasn't been around very long. It's only been around, you know, it, it really, you know, some of the people that are indoor farming um, that have been out there for 10 years, that's... That's like a long time. That's a, a, a very long sure. uh, company. So so we knew that the technology was advancing, but we weren't quite there yet. And then we thought, well, what about uh, high-tech greenhouses? And we started researching high-tech greenhouses, and that's why we, we went to, to Europe. And with high-tech greenhouses, what we found is that in Holland, they make perfect sense. And they provide almost all the food for Europe, all of the fresh produce for Europe. There. Really? Yeah, this little country. Well, it's because it's not a very wide country. It's right on the sea. The um, All of the greenhouses face in the same direction, and then they get the North Sea, the cool air, to go in and cool the greenhouses. They, it's a rather moderate climate. They don't have tons of sun, or you know, but they do get sun. So it's very easy to – not very easy, but it's pretty easy to be able to grow in a greenhouse there because the climate's always the same. Mm-hmm. And you don't have the spikes. Well, when you start looking in the U.S. about greenhouses, uh, if you're in Ohio, it's very different than if you're in Texas. And um, being able to heat and cool, especially cool a greenhouse, is very expensive and very complicated. And uh, we recognize that we would have to have different configurations of greenhouses depending on the location in the U.S. And it was really our intention to be able to scale indoor farming and have fresh produce in communities all over the U.S., not just one big massive farm that then we're trucking from maybe the middle of the country all over, but really have um, food hub centers near populations. So we, we kind of, when we were exploring the, the greenhouse angle, we didn't really think that the technology, the grower community, and being able to scale really made sense. So that's when we came back to indoor farming and uh, started partnering with some of the best in, in the technology space um, and collaborating with them to develop indoor farms. That's incredible. So, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about getting growers Mm -hmm. to participate in in these movements Mm and in the indoor farming movement and that vision of you and Mike on the ground talking with growers, understanding their challenges and working with them in a context where they were sort of going a traditional route, Mm -hmm. like sending their produce to canning processors. Now that you're collaborating with growers to really shape the future Mm -hmm. of what indoor farms might do, what sorts of stories and, you know, communication do you find yourself sharing with them in order to open their minds to what's possible? Yeah, and I think that, um, that many growers are fascinated uh, because they have a curiosity about plants. And they have a love for, for growing things and seeing them succeed. And so some of the growers that we have working at 80 Acres – are hardcore growers that were growing outdoors. They were growing in greenhouses, and um, but they really have a love for food production and a love for watching good, healthy crops come up. So, and, and I think that many of them find it incredibly interesting because we can control all of the variables. So you really can see the potential of a plant and how you can unleash that potential with different stressors. And so what I hear from many of the growers is they get great satisfaction from being able to um, see the crops grow faster because typically, you know, our heads of lettuce are going growing in 24 to 28 days um, versus a field-grown crop is going to grow 90 to 120 days. Wow, that's so a big you, difference. You get, yes. you get that feedback pretty fast, and you can go through a lot of cycles, and you can see how 
um, one variable or two variables changing really affects the crops. And so they can learn really fast about the impact to the crop. And I think that um, they're, they're also able to grow a wider variety of crops uh, than they possibly would be able to in a conventional way. Um, one of the ways that we're using storytelling to talk about our technology is we have had the most incredible opportunity to partner with Rem Kohlhaas at an exhibition at the Guggenheim on Fifth Avenue in New York. Wow. And so they reached out to us and they said, we would like to talk about um, the countryside and we'd like to talk about the implications of uh, food production, countryside, technology, and how that all intersects, um, comparing it to the cities. And he said, we've been to your module. Um, we'd love to have something uh, at the Guggenheim. And I said, I would <laughs> love to be able to grow tomatoes on Fifth Avenue. Right. And so right now we're growing tomatoes on on Fifth Avenue. We're there till August. And it's it's starting a conversation. When right, you think about right. storytelling and you think about what can be with technology, then it just it it, it it's starting a con- it, it's already starting a conversation. You wouldn't believe the number of people that just walk up to us off off of the street and they say, "We have to bring our kids here. We want kids to come. We want everybody to see how food is really produced." Oh my and goodness! And talking Tell about me. how you can produce it in a city instead of shipping it, you know, thousands of miles. That's right. So wow. um, it's it, it's a tangible example of exciting storytelling that we're doing right now. I love that so much. That's it's it's really neat. Is it a pod that's sort of inside the Guggenheim? No, or is it on the street? It's on the street. It's on Fifth Avenue. It is. I, I was there last week. It is traffic stopping. So, what does it, it look like? It's um, well, it is. It looks kind of like giant shipping containers. It's um, f- it would be four shipping containers, so two stacked on top of one another. So it's about fifteen feet tall and about twenty feet wide, and it looks like it has. Um, You know, it's uh, prefabricated uh, walls, and it has giant windows uh, in the front, so you can see the purple light shining through onto um, right into the park, and you can see um, the plants growing. We have uh, our grower David is there, making sure that the crop is is being cared for. We're going to have tomatoes that are are going to be growing in the next uh, in the next 45 days we'll have tomatoes and we're going to first give some of the tomatoes to the restaurant at the Guggenheim so you can eat them. Oh, of course, wonderful. we're going to share tons of tomatoes with people on the street and then we're giving the rest to City Harvest. Wow, that's incredible. So really partnership in in so many different ways is um, is really elevating your yes. mission. Yeah, the, the the Guggenheim has been a wonderful, and they just um, reached out. They did well. Yeah, it was it was Rem and Oma that uh, reached out to us and said, "This is an exhibition I've been he's been working on for ten years, uh, and he's been working closely with the Guggenheim for the past couple years, and it was just a tremendous experience and to be able to hear his story about how the countryside is changing and the things that he's seen through his travels and what concerns him about um, you know the permafrost melting and the you know the the polar ice caps and the, the how the countryside is changing um, is it's fascinating so it, it is in the Guggenheim is a perfect place to tell stories because if you think about it the it, those that haven't been to the Guggenheim it's circular it's a ramp and you go um, you start at the bottom and you're starting about um, thinking about the history of the countryside and what the countryside meant to people thousands of years ago. And then as you're going up the ramp, it's six levels, I think, uh, when you get to the top, it's it's all about the high tech technology that is helping kind of bring the countryside back and food production. And and so it's just a wonderful way to be able to tell a story in a very circular way. And so anybody that's looking for storytelling about the countryside and the evolution of the countryside should go. <laughs> that's really neat. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. So um, is there a place, is there a website or like a hashtag people can follow to see that? Yeah, well, absolutely. You can go um, out to our 80 Acres Farms website to get information about about it, or you can go to infinite-acres.com is uh, the infinite website. Uh, you can also go out to the Guggenheim and see uh, see it. And so we're in the process of 
of probably getting a camera in there so people can see the plant growth uh, as we're as we're doing it. That would be amazing. And some reaction. Uh, the the thing that I think is fun is seeing the reaction of the people as they're walking down the street and understanding um, you know the questions that they're asking. And so it's 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 an exciting time. So neat. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. it's, it's a really powerful example of innovation storytelling and, yes. and making that accessible to all. Yeah. Anybody that anybody that's walking uh, walking past the Guggenheim. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much vulnerability to the life yeah. of a grower, and in a lot of ways, bringing them in as partners yeah. and uh, allowing them to have the space they need to mm-hmm. experiment and feel some sense of control. Yeah. It sounds like this is a really exciting new innovation for that world in particular. Absolutely, and the the other thing too is that you know growers are people of nature. They like to see things grow, and they understand that uh, our current methods of farming are not sustainable, and th- they do the very best they can with the resources they're given. But being able to to grow in such a way where you really are sustainable and you're really using a lot less of the natural resources and you're using them in an efficient way is um, something that's really appealing. And uh, one of the one of the growers that we have, um, she always says that she loves coming to 80 Acres Farms because she feels like she's um, using less and growing more every day. Wow. So being able to use less, less water, less nutrients, uh, less energy, and being able to get more and more output. That's incredible. Can you put your entrepreneur hat on mm-hmm. for a minute and tell me about the role that storytelling has played as you work to get buy-in from, you, you know, you, we've talked about growers, but also other partners, investors, um, you know, just the world of really growing a startup and scaling it the way that you have is incredibly impressive. And I think you've harnessed the power of story really well in that. Uh, could you share some insights? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, we... Mike and I, um, we like to be able to tell our story and explain to people. It, it's very concrete if you say, like when I told you the story of the growers and how we've been out and we've spent so much time with with growers and understanding their struggles. Um, that's a concrete example that we can explain. We can talk about sustainability and you know all of the high level. Um, benefits of of indoor farming. But when it's really tangible and you can say, you know, I've talked to people, I've seen their struggles, yes. they've shared with me their struggles, and then these are solutions that that can help alleviate some of those those struggles, I think is is really powerful. Um, the the other method or reason why we believe in storytelling is it really conveys um, the foundation of of our culture, the infrastructure, the fiber of our culture, why we um, are doing what we're doing, what's important to us as an organization, and especially as founders, uh, why we did it. Because as we're growing, we are growing very fast. At at 80 Acres, we have 125 people now. Uh, That's incredible. (laughs) And we're looking- We we met about three years ago, right? And I remember maybe there were eight people yeah, on your team right. at the time. That's right. Yeah. You know, we were sharing some of the same conference <laughs> yeah, rooms in our in, right. in our startup hub in Cincinnati. Shout out to Centrifuge and yeah. Union Hall, where a lot of these things ha- start and, yeah. and, and are born. But absolutely. So, a hundred, so over 100. That's amazing. Yeah. So we're at about 125 people now. And as we grow, Mike and I don't have the opportunity to touch as many people as we we used to. We were, you know, sitting across the table. We were all huddled in the same conference rooms, and now, you know, we have um, we have a joint venture um, that's that's based out of Europe. So I'm spending half my time in Europe, half my time in the U.S. And, and that's Infinite Acres. That's correct? Infinite Acres. We'll, yeah. we'll talk about yeah, that yeah, for yeah, sure. I want to hear more about <laughs> Infinite. Yeah. So, but but being able to tell stories and continue to pass those stories along, it's it's the history of our company, just like you tell the history of of your family. It's very personal, and people can relate to it, and then people can get behind um, what you stand for. Yeah. Because it's not just it's not just a job. We're not hiring employees. We're hiring partners that want to make a difference. And and it's really important uh, to Mike and I that we're telling stories. One of my my stories that I, I, I go back to to remember our roots and remember where we came from. Um, Samantha, who was our, our one of our first growers, 
uh, when we first started, we had two containers, and they were on the lot at, at SD, and we were under construction at SD, and everything was a big mud pit because we didn't have <laughs> we didn't have uh, asphalt down yet. We didn't have anything. We just had these two containers, and we didn't even have water. And um, so we were bringing in jugs of water to be able to grow these plants because we had to learn and we had to start, you know, sharing it with with our potential restaurants and retailers and understand what people want and. I remember it was so cold. It was in the it was in the winter time, and she and I were standing in the parking lot drinking coffee and dreaming about the future, thinking about what we're doing now and dreaming about where we'll be in a year and where we'll be in two years. And I hearken back to that because I think when I think about how far we've come in such a short period of time, I couldn't I, we couldn't dream it big enough to <laughs> to where we've ended up. But it always reminds me of uh, us being in the mud pit with our two containers and our cup of coffee and, you know, no no bathrooms and, you know, just trying to to bring in bottles of water. And, and I think that's what we were founded on. We were founded on hard work and knowing that yes. we have this dream of something bigger and better, um, and we really want to make an impact. And we weren't afraid to just get dirty and get in there and figure it out. I think there's so much to kind of learn from that story mm -hmm. as you share it to create a culture mm -hmm. of of partners, as you say, mm -hmm. uh, your employees, to, to make them passionate mm -hmm. about what you're doing, to help them see and really be sort of blown away by what's possible and, and to really be able to embrace change, too. Mm -hmm. it's a, That's a beautiful image. I think every innovator <laughs> listening to this podcast has had a moment where you've been standing in a mud pit, <laughs> <laughs> dreaming, <laughs> dreaming about the future, trying to see what it might look like, what could be. Yeah. So I love that image. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> my pleasure. It, it's uh, it's it's one of my my favorite thoughts. And Samantha and I still talk about it because then now I'm like, okay, what's our next mud pit? Well, okay, so now we have another mud pit, and it's called our 70k building in Hamilton, where we're building a gigantic farm, and and so it's it is a mud pit as well because we're in the middle of construction, <laughs> and there's something about mud in a soilless uh, indoor farming solution, but. We um, when we broke ground there and we had our groundbreaking ceremony, the whole team was there and there's a picture of us and it's raining <laughs> and we're all there. And I think half of us lost our shoes in the mud because we decided <laughs> that we wanted to go out into the site. And so, um, yeah, so mud and, and cold, rainy weather has played. a <laughs> That is <laughs> so pretty ironic for a soilless <laughs> indoor agricultural setup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that image. Okay, so so then out of the growth of eighty acres mm -hmm. came Infinite Acres. So right. you have to catch me up. It's been maybe a year since I, um, since yeah. we've chatted about this. Yeah, so it's it's exciting. So when we think about what Mike and I have have built with our team uh, since twenty fifteen, we we had the opportunity to meet some of the most amazing people. And uh, through this process, because, you know, the industry is really small in, in indoor farming. There aren't a lot of people out there. And everybody's struggling to try to figure out how to really scale it, how to make money at, the, uh, at it as a, as a business. And Mike and I quickly realized that there are people out there in the industry, in the horticulture industry, in automation and manufacturing, that will know, will forget more than we could possibly learn. And... We recognize that there is so much to do. There's so many challenges out there that you have to conquer when you're looking at a new industry. We couldn't do it alone. Or we could do it alone, but it would take too long. And it would take a lot of money. And it would take a lot of effort. And why would you do that <laughs> when there's so many great people out there that want to share? They want to share their stories. They want to share their trials and tribulations. And many of those trials and tribulations we've done together. So I mentioned that we were building that farm at Esty. Well, we were building it with a company called Priva. And Priva is a premier um, water and building control system company. They've been around for uh, 60 years, uh, based out of the Netherlands. And many of the commercial greenhouses uh, and greenhouse installations across Europe and even in North America have their, their, their stuff in it, have their, um, their water systems and their building control systems. So as we were working together with them, you know, we... 
we we had a lot of struggles. We had a lot of struggles when we first started our farm. Um, it had never been done before. Right. And we killed a lot of plants. Mm -hmm. And Priva helped us kill a lot of plants together. <laughs> and there was a point at which, you know, it was it was such a struggle and and there's a lot of pressure to perform. And we had a very honest conversation with Priva and we said, Do you we think that we should just part ways and we're gonna figure out how to do this on our own. Um, and they said, we want to be your partner. We think that it's really important. We want to figure out how to do this together. And so we decided rather than breaking up that we would do it together because 80 Acres understands manufacturing operations, merchandising, how to get produce in front of the, the retailer and the food service provider. Mike and I have 25 years of experience in the food industry. Priva really understands plants and they really understand climate and what it needs to grow them. So rather than us going and innovating on our own and figuring all that out, um, and them trying to figure out how to how to merchandise it and how to how to turn it into a business, we decided that we would do it together. And so after that, we um, we formed Infinite Acres. So it was a joint a joint venture between the two of us uh, to start with. But then there was another company that came along, and they said, "Well, we want to get into indoor farming." And you know, when we, when when Priva and Eighty Acres first started, we started mapping out everything that you need to be able to have an indoor farm. You need to have, you know, lighting solution where you understand the impact. You have to be able to understand the the crop science and the seeds and you need to understand automation and you need to be able to to build the building and run manufacturing and, you know, you need to be able to do all the data collection. And we started honestly assessing where we're really good, where we have great technology and where we need where we need help. And so um, Ocado is, um, it's the world's largest grocery retailer online. Okay. So grocery retailer, and they're based out of the UK. Okay. They're a fabulous, fabulous company, very innovative. And they get moving stuff. They understand how to move stuff in a very highly efficient manner. And they have the absolute best predictive analytics. So they can get groceries to you in London traffic and you know, get it on time in an hour. Wow! Um, so they're they're an amazing company. So they wanted to partner with us. So what we we did is we said, well, there's always room for more, right? <laughs> because we didn't we didn't really have a solution there yet, right? And so we needed people that understood understood predictive analytics and and um, we understand moving things, moving automation. And so we we brought them on, and then we have. Um, Another partner that that wanted to come on just as a, a supplier partner, which is Signify. They're the lighting company. And then we have seed companies that want to come on. So what started out as um, a great story of two companies that were struggling to figure out how to work together, deciding, okay, we're, no matter how hard it is, it's like, it's kind of like a marriage, you know, no matter how hard. <laughs> we're sticking it out. Uh, we're going to stick it out. And we're going <laughs> to yeah. figure out how to make it work sure. and we're going to like it. Um we have all these companies that want to come together with us and they want to collaborate because we recognize it's too big for any any one company to really do it. That's right. If 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 we want to take this industry and mature it and advance it, we we need to be able to collaborate with with the best people and then innovate in the gaps because, you know, identify where everybody's really good, where they play and where they're contributing and then figure out what else you need. And that's very pointed innovation for us. So that's Infinite Acres. And I'm, I am I have the distinct pleasure and honor to be the CEO of that company. Tell us about some of the current projects or efforts or initiatives yeah. happening at Infinite. <laughs> okay. So we have, we have so many things. That, so it's so crazy. Um, the first farm that we're building is in Hamilton and it's for 80 acres. And it's, um, we call it the 70K. It's 70,000 square feet. Um, anybody here in Cincinnati go drive through the Enterprise Park and you'll see this big structure that's being put up right now. Um, and we're calling that our reference design because we believe that to be able to innovate and then scale, it's really important to have a standard. And that is our standard by which we are going to take it globally. So we have um, a project in Shanghai that we're also working on that about mm, two or three months after we finished the, the reference design, which will be late summer, uh, we'll finish the, the farm in Shanghai. And then we have um, intentions to build a farm uh, with 80 acres and another company in the Scandinavian region. We have two projects in Canada that we're working on. Plus, we have another project in um, 
uh, on the Atlantic coast. And so we have, uh, we have about five or six projects that we're working on actively right now, big projects that will, will help us see the technology and innovation of the reference design through and, and, and scale. So we, we are very busy on projects. Uh, 80 Acres is a tremendous support and great partner with us. And then we're also continuing to innovate because, you know, what what you have now is 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 the best that, that we can do. But we know there's so much more innovation out there that we need to do. And we're really relying on our partners at Priva, our partners at Ocado and uh, 80 Acres to continue driving that innovation forward. Absolutely. It's such an important lesson for interdisciplinary innovation, <laughs> not being afraid or thinking. I, I don't think that organizations have the luxury anymore of working in pure isolation. Mm -hmm. Even the largest, most established enterprises are setting up venture programs mm -hmm. and trying to scout the best startup ideas and talent or, mm -hmm. or taking a completely open innovation mm -hmm. pathway where they're trying to crowdsource the best ideas too. So um, I, I love that as an example of interdisciplinary, uh, cross-functional collaboration, mm -hmm. not not looking at the other players as competitors, but yeah. seeing how might we do this together? What might be possible if we, if we can kind of harness all of our talents and, and all of our resources? Yeah, I, I, I believe that in indoor farming and really when you think about the way that we grow food, food production, and the challenges we have around food production, we don't have the luxury of time and the luxury or the, the ego to... Um, to figure it all out on our own. The, the, tie, the, the clock is ticking. You know, you have droughts in California, you have droughts everywhere else, you have flooding. Um, we were uh, diminishing our natural resources. We have to have a solution and we can't let our egos get in the way. It's really important to be able to collaborate with the best to be able to push this industry forward. There's so much to offer in this industry. So much of the innovation stories coming out of Infinite Acres and 80 Acres, in my mind, it speaks so powerfully to impact. Mm -hmm. And impact is one of the five drivers that, that our team at Untold has identified in terms of what makes for a powerful innovation story. So impact on sustainability, impact on food and people's access and, and, and hunger mm -hmm. and the challenges around hunger uh, and food deserts and isolation. Um, there are so many different impacts that, that you're able to achieve thanks to moving technologies in this direction. And at the same time, I would imagine any highly innovative organization like yours faces a challenge of helping society see that this is a valid and strong path forward. Mm -hmm. So can you share some of the, the ways in which you're able to communicate your efforts and, uh, and and kind of help people overcome that challenge of not necessarily knowing for sure that that that's it, maybe being a little bit wary of that future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and and that's a challenge. I and I think with with many innovators um, being able to communicate the story and the impact, and there's so many positive, amazing things that um, indoor farming can provide that. How do you narrow it and how do you narrow the message and how do you make sure – because, you know, if I, if I talk about sustainability and I talk about the fresh produce and then I talk about the health and nutrition and being able to um, provide the right nutrients where there's nutrient gaps in people's diet – you know, after the first couple, you're like, oh, the first couple, you're like, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, that's amazing. That's exactly what I want to do. And then you impact overload. And then, that what exactly. That's to? exactly right. And then you talk about the next three or four and they're like, OK, we but get water it. Water conservation, right. too. And then you start talking about like the 10th and 11th and 12th and like, OK, we get it. This might be too good to be true. Oh, it's so, interesting. So almost too much impact in your innovation story can start to raise red flags. I or think make it people... diminishes the story. Isn't and that I, wild? Yeah. And I think that it, it people are wary then and they're like, Ah, you know, I don't really know. It sounds too good to be true. And so for us, it's all about making sure that we are honing in on the the right message for the right audience. And That's when right. we're telling stories and we're talking, what's important to them? So when I'm talking to a retailer, what's important to that retailer? What's important to the customer that is looking to um, buy our produce versus the consumer um, versus uh, society? Mm -hmm. and and governments. And mm -hmm. so it's really... And all the regulatory bodies I'm sure you're having to collaborate with too. It, it, exactly. And yeah. so it's it, it, it can't be a one-size-fits-all and catering our storytelling and honing our message and being really clear with the message I think is the, the most important thing that we can do. 
right That's now. a great problem to have, though. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Impact <laughs> overload is our problem. I know. <laughs> so I, I do envision, though, a, a really great you know, explainer video where you could kind of play yeah. on that in a fun way to sort of yeah. show well, like this and this and this. Okay, we've probably exhausted you, yeah. but, <laughs> exactly. but we promise all of this is true. What matters most is which of these things you care most about. Exactly. That's Ex- funny. Exactly. Yeah. So that's when we think about our branding to our consumer, it's very different than than what the customer wants. And so, yeah, but we, but impact overload. I like that. (laughs) I do too. That's the first time that's come up in in these podcast interviews. So we'll have to add that to our, to our training experiences for innovation storytelling. We are in an amazing space where we can do amazing things. Yes, that's right. So what advice do you have for, for innovators like yourself? If you can think back to four years ago, what advice do you have to people today who have a, a powerful idea, whether they're working in a, a large enterprise organization or they are, are wanting to create their own startup? Mm-hmm. What advice do you have, especially around how to harness the power of story to get buy-in for their ideas? Yeah, I think, I think that it's really important to hone your message. And make sure that the message that you have um, speaks to the benefits of what you're what you're wanting to innovate on. And then you have to think about about great stories and storytelling because as innovators, our trap, in my opinion, is that we get so excited about particularly technology, you get so excited about the tech, you get so excited about the science, you get excited about the impact that you you forget and you go really, really deep. And then I start talking to you about photosynthetic rate and about efficiency <laughs> and about this and that and, you know, and, and, and nutrient, uh, you know, n- the, the nutrients required and the different formulas and recipes. And, and you're like, wow, I just wanted to know what time it was. I didn't, you know, I was like, I didn't, you know, I didn't want all that. And, and, and the message gets lost. Sure. Yeah. And so I think really being able, storytelling is a way um, to be able to tell the story to others that aren't as enthused and bought into your idea. And and then I think it it, it, it makes it into a bite-sized um, uh, piece so that you can get good feedback. Because if you go too deep and too technical, then the average person isn't really going to be able to provide the kind of feedback that you're that you're needing and looking for and, and, and when you're starting out and you're starting on these ideas and it's in your head and you're trying to figure out how to do it you really need collaboration from a lot of people you need a lot of different voices coming from a lot of different places you know some of my some of my best consumer insights are from my mom and uh, you know when I'm talking about you know what what is impactful to a consumer um, so if I start talking to her about photosynthesis and how we can grow faster and you know better, de- de- cheaper, blah blah blah, it's not going to matter to her. Um, but the fact that it's pesticide free and that we picked it, you know, hours, uh, not days or weeks, um, before she gets it, those are things that are important to her. So being able to share your story at the right level. Um, is really important. And in and, and innovators, you get so excited about it. It's so hard right, to yes. kind of stay stay at the right level to really gain that and garner that feedback. I love that advice. We talk a lot about uh, evidence burden, you know, the mm. burden of having too much data and too many statistics and uh-huh. how that can really result in eyes glazing over. Yes. But I think we haven't talked enough, I think, on this podcast about the impact overload and how to really refine it. Um, It's not that you can't know all of those talking points or know what all of those Mm -hmm. impacts are. It's about being selective and and tailoring that, aligning it with Mm -hmm. the audience or the stakeholder you're, you're communicating with. And I love that advice, too, about trying to make it bite size. A bowl. Mm -hmm. That way you can test it and get feedback on that particular Mm -hmm. piece of impact or evidence that you're sharing. Yeah, you can you can always go deeper, um, but it's really hard to 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 get your audience back after you've gone too deep. That's fair. Wonderful. Well, I'm so grateful to have this conversation with you. Thank you for being on the podcast today. I'm so excited to see how Infinite Acres grows and how 80 Acres continues to succeed. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you're doing, because I think really uh, storytelling and innovation and kind of helping us uh, think about how we communicate is is very important. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. I appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.